Thanks very much to the programs in Parents in Science and Women in Science here at Rockefeller University for inviting me. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, and I thank you for the very generous introduction. Um, between that and the material that's in uh, the program, it's increasingly clear uh, just how long I've been doing what I do. Um, and what you may see as you uh, uh, think about uh, some of the positions I've held, um, you'll realize that I started as a clinician. Um, and I like to say that I came by my current role as scientist uh, honestly. And there's nothing like 10 years of doing clinical work to inform a future scientist about the questions that need to be answered. And what I'm hoping to do today is share some of those questions with you and maybe the beginnings of some of the answers. So I titled today's talk, Eating Disorders, Behavioral Disturbances Along a Regulatory Continuum. Um, and you'll let me know whether I succeed in meeting the lofty goals of this title. Just quick disclosures. We're going to talk about eating disorders today, and those include anorexia nervosa, bulimia nervosa, and the new kid on the block, binge eating disorder. Anorexia nervosa is best characterized by the relentless pursuit of thinness, the fear of becoming fat, or the belief that one is fat in someone who's significantly underweight. And there are two subtypes of this condition. The restricting subtype, where the low weight really has to do with the very uh, restricted amount of intake uh, that someone will consume, and the binge purge subtype, where uh, binge eating or purging behavior is also a part of the picture. Anorexia nervosa uh, affects individuals around mid to late adolescence. Um, the prevalence remains quite stable at about half of a percent. Um, there's no question that females are far more affected than males, ratio of about 10 to 1. Uh, morbidity is significant for this illness with every organ system being vulnerable to being affected by um, the low weight state, and the mortality rate is high, as high in fact as that seen in any psychiatric condition, uh, and that is at a rate of approximately 5% per decade of illness. There are lots of associated features, and the physiological as well as behavioral uh, symptoms associated with anorexia nervosa are really thought to uh, be consequences of the state of malnutrition um, and the obsessionality, the depression, the anxiety, um, lots of the psychological uh, signs and symptoms that at one point long ago were thought to be potentially causal are now really understood as being part of the low weight state itself. Physiologically, we're talking about, let's see if I can do the lights, you can see, um, signs of the hypometabolic state, patients are cold, their heart rates are slow, blood pressure is low, there are skin and hair changes with a lanugo or fine hair pattern on uh, often face, neck, and extremities. Um, we see hormonal changes, uh, we see decreased brain mass on scans, and we see significant changes in bone health um, with osteoporosis occasionally being present in even some of our youngest patients. This is a picture of Lanugo, that hair pattern I mentioned, and really it can be quite notable. Bulimia nervosa is described uh, as including recurrent episodes of binge eating together with recurrent inappropriate behaviors to avoid weight gain, most commonly vomiting and laxative abuse. Uh, the episodes occur with good frequency, uh, defined as at least twice weekly for a period of at least three months. The age of onset's a little bit later, uh, still in adolescence, sometimes young adulthood. Uh, prevalence higher, 1 to 3 percent to the population. Females are also more affected than males, although uh, the ratio is not quite as high. Uh, these patients are most commonly normal weight uh, because, again, if there's binge and vomiting behaviors in someone who is very low in weight, uh, that person probably meets criteria for anorexia nervosa. And serious medical complications the kind, oops, the kind that um, are really harmful for some of the central organ systems are less common, um, but 
That doesn't mean that there aren't significant problems. And this is a picture of the dental erosion and shortening uh, that can be seen in bulimia nervosa due to the acid that washes over the teeth regularly with the frequent vomiting behavior. Binge eating disorder, and that's uh, um, defined as regular episodes of binge eating. That doesn't mean the large Thanksgiving meal we hopefully all enjoyed just last week, um, but uh, periods of uh, discrete um, eating of amounts that are large for the context and situation uh, without any consistent pattern, I I'm sorry, together with a real sense of loss of control, um, without any pattern of behaviors to avoid weight gain. And these episodes have to also uh, meet frequency criteria. The age of onset for this is later, mostly in adulthood. It's rare to have frank binge eating disorder in childhood. Prevalence is higher two to three percent, and actually among obese populations presenting for treatment, uh, we see very large numbers of, of those with binge eating disorder, probably 20 to 30 percent of those in obesity clinics meet criteria for binge eating disorder. The gender ratio is far more balanced, and this is commonly associated with overweight or obesity, and there's a high frequency of co-occurring mood and anxiety disorders. Okay, so how do we understand the symptoms of eating disorders? We'll often get a report of uh, the syndrome starting with dietary restraint or efforts at restraint. And for some, binge eating develops. And the binge eating may, in turn, lead to and reinforce the dietary restraint. For some who binge eat, vomiting behavior or purging of some sort develops. And again, there are vicious cycles that develop where the depleting that takes place with the purge leads to an additional binge and over and over. In terms of prototypes, anorexia nervosa is the condition with most of the restraint. Binge eating disorder certainly is described by those binge episodes, and bulimia nervosa includes uh, the vomiting behavior. Um, as we think about these conditions in any kind of a spectrum, and I realize it's a bit of a reach as I uh, talk about these illnesses this way, I wonder whether these are all problems in one way or another of control. Bulimia and binge eating disorder are characterized by difficulty, if you will, maintaining behavioral control around eating. Uh, regulation seems difficult for these folks. And in contrast, the anorexia nervosa patients are characterized by overregulation or over control. So what do we know about anorexia nervosa? and the eating behavior thereof, um, not much. And the first uh, published study that took a look at individuals with anorexia nervosa in the lab and actually observed and recorded what they ate uh, was done about 10 years ago by Colleen Hadigan. Um, and a group of individuals with anorexia nervosa, 30-something, and individuals who are normal controls were uh, observed for a 24-hour period and indeed folks with anorexia nervosa eat less, about a thousand calories less over 24 hours. Uh, they don't eat from only one macronutrient group but they do eat in a statistically significantly different fashion, uh, less fat and more carbohydrate than their healthy volunteer uh, controls. We thought we would try our hand at Columbia uh, at taking a look at eating behavior for anorexia nervosa patients ourselves. And we actually have uh, the good fortune to have a program that allows us to refeed patients with anorexia nervosa and to bring, oops, I'm sorry, bring their weights, their BMI, from a low starting BMI of about 15 to a normal range BMI at a level of about 20, that's about 90% of the weight recommended for height, we're able to do that successfully. And we see that in those individuals where we normalize weight, we're able to get lots of psychological symptoms uh, to look much better with that weight normalization. This is a measure of depression, Beck depression inventory, much better when weight is normal. Some eating disorder measurements, a restraint scale much better, an eating scale much better a drive for thinness measure, much better, uh, bulimia nervosa symptoms, much better, uh, with the weight restoration that these patients um, uh, 
uh, go through without any help of any medications, just nutritional rehabilitation. And we wanted to see whether we could note difference in the laboratory setting in terms of eating behavior. So we designed a task where we asked patients to drink uh, some strawberry yogurt shake out of an opaque container. Uh, this was their lunch for the day, and they were given a set instruction. This is your lunch for the day. Eat as much or as little as you'd like. And here's what happened. In our 12 subjects, at low weight um, and at normalized weight, let's see, on average, patients ate very small amounts for this observed lunch, and maybe a little bit more, but not much more, about 150 or 200 calories for lunch, when their weights were otherwise totally normalized. And this was much different than what controls did, who were eating in a much uh, more robust fashion. And this was much different from what these same patients were being asked to do in the hospital setting where they were eating seven, eight, nine hundred calories a day for their lunch, um, and yet when given the opportunity in a lab to do what they thought they needed for lunch, um, they ate in this uh, very minimal fashion. Something's off with control. Something is hyper-regulated in terms of their eating controls. Okay, in search for some information about why this might be, uh, We've, we've looked far and wide. And we have uh, actually um, gotten interested in a field called neuroeconomics, an interdisciplinary science that combines methods from economics, from behavioral economics, from neuroscience, from uh, social psychology, um, in an effort to characterize human behavior, and specifically decision making. Delayed discounting is a concept uh, within neuroeconomics um, that tries to define a pattern that's seen in normal decision making in which the value of future opportunities is discounted. So people offered $5 today or $20 in two weeks will commonly and maybe surprisingly select the $5. It turns out that we can use mathematical modeling to very precisely and accurately describe decision making and to predict what normal populations will do when given various choices. There are two neural sy systems that are thought to be underlying these choices. The medial ventral striatum, where the reward system is thought to live, uh, seems related to the immediate choice function, the $5 today part of the equation. And the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is oriented to the delayed choice, the $20 in two weeks part. And we're learning more and more about how different clinical populations respond to these kinds of uh, choices. Clinical populations with increased impulsivity, substance abuse populations, for example, seem to discount more steeply. And a little blurry, but this is a discount rate curve. This is the curve that's generated by that mathematical modeling, and it describes what happens to the discount rate over time. The longer you ask someone to wait before they receive a reward, the less value it has to them. And indeed, impulsive people discount more steeply, and individuals who are thought to be more self-controlled seem to discount less steeply. Okay? They're more patient. So we had the question. Do individuals with anorexia nervosa discount future opportunities less deeply than normal? Um, we're guessing that elements of their behavior have these pieces of overcontrol, uh, but we don't know how they'd function with this task. And look how beautiful those curves are. So um, indeed, folks with anorexia nervosa restricting subtype and binge purge subtype sit above at a less steep place on this curve. Actually, in terms of the statistically significant difference, it's the restricting subgroup that really do separate out from a normal population. Interesting. We're not sure all of what to do with this. Any other leads? Any other suggestions for what might be contributing to these real difficulties that our patients have uh, in eating adequate amounts? 
So I'm going to go back to the eating behavior studies for a minute and um, let you know we've got accumulated data from laboratory-based meals, all sorts. We've gone beyond the popcorn container. Um, and we've tried different things, um, and we have uh, data to show you um, that all were collected in similar fashion, even though some of the tasks are a little bit different from each other. They all follow standardized breakfast, nothing by mouth till the study meal at around lunchtime. And for all of these um, laboratory assessments, uh, we collected anxiety measurements, Spielberger anxiety inventory, the state version, prior to the meal. So we have information about how our patients are feeling in terms of anxiety before they ate. We've tried the macaroni and cheese meal, we've tried a yogurt meal, and most recently, most frightening for our patients, we've tried the multi-item lunch where we ask patients to assemble uh, a lunch for themselves. Here's what we found. No big surprise is that in all settings and with all of these tasks, patients ate less than our controls. Okay, uh, sometimes not much less. This was the yogurt snack. Uh, sometimes much less. This is the multi-item meal. Uh, but here's the information that I find most interesting. And for each of our tasks, yogurt, multi-item, and macaroni and cheese, we're plotting anxiety right, as compared with intake, and the more anxious someone was before they approached their meal, the less they ate. Now, uh, having worked with these patients for a long time, I, I was beginning to believe that all people ate this way, right? I wasn't sure when I saw these data just what we were really learning. Okay, you're anxious, you're upset, so maybe you don't eat as much. So here's really my favorite slide. And it doesn't show all the data from all the folks that we've collected information on, but it gives you the major point in terms of the curve. We actually use some fancy st statistics to put all of our prior studies together in one slide, and sure enough, the more anxious someone is, the less that they eat. Um, this is what normal controls do. Some feel anxious, some don't feel anxious, some eat, some don't want to eat, but there's absolutely no correlation between the two. It's lunchtime. People who don't have eating disorders eat lunch. And that difference is really notable to us and very important as we think about what our patients may need from us in order to respond to treatments. So, anorexia nervosa. Restraint and over control of eating behavior is central to the illness. Intake is low at low weights and at normalized weights. Individuals with AN appear to have the ability to defer immediate gratification and tolerate longer weights to achieve rewards. Anxiety sure may contribute to food restriction, and these bi biological features may have implications for treatment, and I think it's going to be during the Q&A that we'll get a chance to talk about some of those hypotheses. What about bulimia nervosa? What do we know about eating behavior in bulimia nervosa? Now, we've been doing eating behavior studies in bulimia nervosa for longer than we've been doing them in anorexia nervosa, so note the retro uh, appearance to this multi-item meal, but we did multi-item work with this group as well. Um, and this is actually a slide that describes what happens when we asked patients with bulimia nervosa to binge eat. And we did ask them to binge eat, um, and they took in far more calories than did those who were healthy when asked to binge. Uh, look, calories as high as eight or 9,000 uh, calories at a sitting. Um, they didn't just eat the Oreos. They ate from all food groups. Um, maybe a little difference in how much protein they took in, but they ate from, from all the containers that we offered them. Uh, here's how many calories individuals with bulimia nervosa eat when we ask them not to binge, but to simply eat a meal. They eat less than normal controls. So it seems as though uh, when patients uh, binge eat, they eat substantial numbers of calories. When they're not binge eating, they may be restricting, restraining some. Let's see. How can we understand these behaviors? We have actually used positron emission tomography, PET, to help understand um, what may be responsible for some of these behavioral disturbances. And PET is an imaging technology that uses radioactive ligands to visualize brain receptor locations and concentrations of these receptors. And they can be used, it can be used to examine brain function 
and neurotransmitter systems such as the serotonin system or the dopamine system are studied using PET. So we've become interested in studying brain dopamine in bulimia nervosa. Um, and the reason for this is that uh, we believe that dopamine is involved in eating processes and in reward processes. Um, we also know that uh, brain dopamine is uh, implicated in drug-seeking behaviors and in addiction disorders. And um, there are many who have wondered about the overlap in clinical symptoms between bulimia nervosa and addictions. Um, let's see. So PET can be used to actually measure dopamine transmission. In other words, PET can help estimate how much dopamine is released from a presynaptic nerve cell, the, the cells on the left. Uh, we measure dopamine release with the help of a dopamine-like ligand or molecule, and specifically carbon-11 raclopride has been used for this purpose. And we do two scans to try to estimate how much dopamine is actually released. Uh, in the first scan, raclopride gives us an estimate of the dopamine receptors, okay, and in a second scan, we give raclopride together with methylphenidate or Ritalin, which we know leads nerve cells presynaptic nerve cells to release uh, dopamine. And the difference in binding, the difference in raclopride binding between the two scans gives us this estimate of how much dopamine was actually released. Now we know that dopamine release is blunted in those who uh, are dependent on cocaine or alcohol. Uh, when someone has never seen a substance of abuse, uh, there's a more robust release of dopamine. And when someone has a problem with an addiction, we see a sluggish, blunted uh, release of dopamine. And we had the question about whether um, individuals with bulimia nervosa may behave uh, more like those with uh, addictive disorders. So we wanted to take a look. So we actually took individuals with bulimia nervosa and we performed two PET scans an hour apart and before the second scan um, gave methylphenidate and both scans involved the carbon-11 raclopride. Um, we standardized the condition with a uh, standardized meal before the PET scan and used a controlled hospital setting for where the patients were staying before the scan and we tried as best we could to uh, standardize for the place in the menstrual cycle that each of our patients um, were at. And just briefly, let me show you what we found. So um, this slide actually uh, has on the x-axis the difference between these two scans in terms of binding potential. And um, this level of difference, more difference, um, actually uh, relates to a greater degree of dopamine released. And um, this zero number is actually the place where there's no difference between the two scans. And this correlation uh, suggests that individuals with a larger number of binge episodes in the previous 28 days behave more like we would expect in somebody who's got an addictive disorder, a more sluggish release of dopamine. Um, that's awfully interesting and tells us that elements of these reward pathways may really be a part of the story um, for bulimia nervosa. So we've got eating behavior that's clearly abnormal, uh, self-regulatory or control systems that appear to be disturbed, and dopamine release and reward mechanisms seem to be a part of this condition in some important way. So it's been a lot of the science of all of this and a lot of information, and yes, probably more of my questions than uh, the answers. Um, but eating disorders are serious mental illnesses associated with physiological and behavioral symptoms. Uh, they appear to include a spectrum of control disturbances, uh, ranging from the very tight control we see in anorexia nervosa to the poor eating control seen in bulimia nervosa and binge eating disorder. And rigorous study of eating behavior and associated brain function may contribute to our understanding of what perpetuates um, these challenging conditions. And with that, I thank you and my colleagues with who, without whom this wouldn't have been possible. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. It's uh, a great pleasure to be here. It's always such a receptive audience. I've spoken before the women in science, never for the parents in science, but it's a real pleasure 
I appreciate your being here. I'm, my job now is to try to take these eating disorders and put a, a touch of the brain to it and try to explain why we have eating problems. Uh, what I'd like to uh, recognize first, however, is, is members of my laboratory. Uh, I think this is what makes science so much fun and exciting, challenging at times. Um, but working with uh, younger investigators, it's, this is what makes it all. And of course, they do all the hard work, and we just come up with the ideas, and they get it all done. So it, it's a great pleasure. So I'm, I'm going to share with you um, some of our work uh, from a variety of perspectives to try to address questions like, we, we've seen these statistics. Uh, obesity, of course, is on the rise, and it's really uh, quite scary, really, what's to come into the future. And I'm going to try to give you some explanations of why it is on the rise, and of course, the food we have in front of us um, is, is, I think, a major part of that problem. And, uh, but of course, exercise is another aspect of it as well. So I'm going to pose to you 10 questions and try to answer them as quickly as I can. Um, first, going to just give you a sense of, the, um, of really how we go about studying these problems. Um, then I will proceed from there to give some examples of how, why we overeat fat or sugar, or why obesity is on the rise, and developmentally what's occurring. And then the next four questions, though, I will try to address some of the issues that Dr. Tia raised, and just how we can relate our work to understanding the causes and perhaps treatments for eating disorders. Uh, and then lastly, I'll, I'll give you a sense of where our research is going at this point. I'd like to get to the second half of the talk uh, quickly. I just want to give you the background of what's going on in the lab and, and uh, how we go about studying the different uh, problems uh, at hand. So what, what techniques and procedures do we use? Uh, well, this is, this is uh, our subject, the rat. And uh, we also study mice. Um, but I can tell you the rat and the mice, they just love the same foods we do. And they eat as much as they want, and they get fat just like we do. And uh, so it's, it's, a, it's, it's a very appropriate subject to have. Um, and in the brain of the rat, in the mouse, as well as in humans, we have the same chemicals. Uh, this is showing uh, a galanin and neuropeptide Y are two peptides, as we call them. They're small proteins. Uh, and these are expressed in an area of the brain called the hypothalamus. And uh, we are looking at, of course, other brain areas, and that's very important. Uh, looking outside the hypothalamus in areas that may be involved as you go forward in the brain uh, relating to stress and anxiety, features that Dr. Tia mentioned, as well as in the cortex in terms of cognitive and impulsive behavior. Uh, these are areas that we are now studying beyond the hypothalamus, but this shows the chemicals in the hypothalamus. I'll mention these a little bit, but there are a lot of chemicals, and so we're trying to study a, a wider variety of them, and uh, it's a, a question of how to do that, and we can measure them, as I indicated there, or we also can inject them. We either inject the neurochemicals directly into the brain or try to antagonize the action of the neurochemicals, or we can do a genetic manipulations and see the outcome there. So I just want to give you a basic sort of uh, uh, background in terms of some of the initial findings over the past uh, 30 years, I shall say. Um, we do know that animals, as in humans, uh, that uh, they eat larger meals of palatable foods. Well, duh, you know, that's not terribly exciting, but it, you, you need to show it in the animals, and so we showed it. Um, but what people don't look at normally is what happens after that palatable meal, and I don't know how you feel after your Thanksgiving uh, dinner. I'm sure you're all trying to lose weight now, but um, after you have palatable foods, it's the next meal that's the problem because then you eat more after that meal. We're trying to understand that as well. It's not just because it's palatable, but it's what happens afterwards. Uh, these palatable foods induce food cravings and even perhaps addictive-like behavior. 
Now, there are many chemicals, neurochemicals in the brain, and we need to really broaden what we're looking at at this point, and that's what we're trying to do. I will mention just the opiate peptides because they're more familiar, uh, and Keflin happens to be one I will describe, but these chemicals are all stimulating eating. There's not so many that suppress eating. It's more stimulating eating, and I think that was welcome in nature to uh, uh, actually promote uh, uh, gorging behavior because, as you mentioned, as you see like a lion in the Serengeti, you'll see him gorging on something. It's, it's really important to eat fast in, in nature. But some of these peptides are related to fat and some are to sugar, and so we've tried to define those mechanisms. But in addition, these same chemicals that control our eating behavior, behavior are going to control uh, reward mechanisms, cravings, as well as feelings of anxiety and impulsivity, the same chemicals. So if you control one chemical, it's going to have a lot of other consequences other than uh, affecting our food intake. And another point I want to end on is really if we have any way of controlling eating behavior and eating disorders, uh, it's very difficult to control one neurochemical because the others are changing too. The question is, can we possibly control things like nutrients circulating in the blood, which we've learned control these neurochemicals? And so there may be other ways to deal with this rather than going right to a neurochemical and controlling that. Now, this is one final background slide I wanted to present. Uh, sort of what we call a positive feedback loop, whereas when we eat, we affect the diet, uh, that we affect a, a diet-sensitive neurochemicals in the brain, and then these neurochemicals come right back and make us eat more. So this is a positive feedback loop, and you may know it by these phrase, the more we eat, the more we want. Well, you know, the first thing I go for are potato chips, so you just go there and you just have to keep eating until you stop. Um, this is what, this is a phrase you're not so familiar with, but that's uh, Shakespeare, 400 years ago, had said the same thing. So that's not a novel concept. Well, we're trying to be novel, we're trying to fill in the gaps here. So this is our little black box here, things in the blood, which we think the nutrients are very important, and controlling these neurochemicals, the opiates, various peptides, and as well as dopamine. And Dr. Tia mentioned dopamine, I must say it's, it's very astonishing that things we do uh, see in the brain uh, in terms of dopamine, how it relates to the eating behavior uh, are quite remarkably similar to what's described in humans. And uh, I won't be talking about that today, but it is, there are dramatic changes in dopamine in relation to our eating behavior. So let me go on to the second question. So that's the background. Now let me give you a few examples of each of these four next questions I'm going to ask. The first related to fat. Um, how do we understand why do we overweight fat? Well, oh, it just tastes good, so big deal. Well, it, it's more than that. We obviously have to know, well, why does it taste good, and then what, what effect does it have on our, our behaviors? So what we find is when we inject these neurochemicals into the brain, um, we can stimulate intake of a high-fat diet, but very little of the low-fat diet. Now, these are animals that are normal weight, and they eat both, fine. But when you put this chemical in, they go for the fat. And that's not with all chemicals, but certain chemicals. And this one happens to be an opiate peptide. But what happens in reverse is that when you give the animals the high-fat diet, it does stimulate the production of that same chemical in the brain. So we have what, we're, what I talked about, this positive feedback. So when we eat the high-fat meal, uh, and just even a single meal of 10 calories or something like that, the animals show increased expression here. You can see in this area here more peptides here than here. Other areas don't respond. And so it's a very clear effect. Just eating one meal, the chemical is stimulated, this opiate peptide. And this stimulation occurs in relation to circulating triglycerides in the blood. So now we have a link with something in the blood and something in the brain. Okay, so that's fat. Uh, now we go on to sugar. It's very different. And I won't have time to elaborate on this, but uh, just to say here that, um, uh, just walk you through it, that when we eat sugar-rich foods, to take the soda, can you imagine that a soda that's being consumed these days? Uh, it raises glucose, so we know that. And then we also know, well, when glucose rises, insulin rises too to lower the glucose. But when you drink too much of the sugar, 
then you get too much of a high and too much of a low, and then what happens is we get what we call the stress hormone can be released, which then stimulates peptides to make us then eat more sugar. And this is another peptide, neuropeptide Y. So it's very different. The mechanism is very different. Uh, so I just wanted to give that as an example of how what we eat, fat or sugar, uh, they are different mechanisms that underlie them. Now, in terms of uh, childhood obesity, I mean, we all see this. It's very scary. Uh, it's, it's hard to know what to do at this point. And this is what I, in the next two uh, questions, want to focus on. Um, it's very clear that uh, what's important is uh, this early exposure to high-fat diet. Um, what the kids are exposed to now is just very different uh, to what uh, at least I was exposed to many years ago as I was growing up. What we know is just some early exposure, let's say after weaning, after the animals before puberty, you give them a little of fat diet. What it does is it sets the stage. The brain is already set to be more sensitive to that fat. Uh, and that there's just obviously early weight gain that occurs, there's early puberty onset, and a greater risk uh, for adult obesity. So that, I mean, again, that's not surprising. That's exactly what's happening, and therefore the earlier you're exposed to it, the bigger the effects that you get on, on brain development as well as the whole body and on behavior, which I'll get to in a little bit. So what's been in the papers recently, a, a number of uh, you know, articles on it coming out, it's just the general idea that the brain is programmed by our diets. Well, I, I'm afraid that is true. They are programmed in such that the, the earlier you expose the the animal or the person to, to these diets, then their, their effects will be perhaps permanent. And that's what's scary here. And so our kids have been exposed to these diets in ways that we never were, at least I never was. Um, so I asked myself, well, what happens when you give a pregnant dam, a pregnant rat, um, a high-fat diet, even a matter of a few days? It wasn't like the mother never got fat. The mother was normal weight. Uh, but, the, but she was eating fat, so fat was getting into the system and then affecting the, the animal. So what happens to the animal? And, and this is, I will go through four slides that will show you really what is happening in the brain during early development. And as I say, this is what is really frightening in terms of what can happen. So this is our subject, and of course this shows the pups um, uh, after they're born, but she's, she's consuming this diet during the pregnancy. So first, I'm just going to go through a series of, of these slides just to indicate just what happens to neurons. This is a prenatal high-fat diet. This uh, uh, stimulates the development of neur neuronal precursor cells. In this little midline here is where our stem cells are, the neuronal stem cells. And with this high-fat diet, again, even just for a matter of a few days before the development of these neurons, you can see these neurons here migrating over out of this midline to go further into what we call the hypothalamus. And you see they're migrating here in a high-fat diet, but you don't see that at all. They should not be there. They shouldn't be there, but they are by a mother who just ate this high-fat diet for about a week uh, during this period. So what happens? We don't know what type of cells those are. They are going to become neurons. And so we see, did they mature into neurons? And we saw in the embryo. You can see, look at the difference. A high-fat diet affecting compared to the balanced diet. All these yellow are neurons. You can see them enlarged here. And they are new neurons stimulated by that high-fat diet. So now, what is the phenotype of those neurons? What, what are they going to become? Are they just going to go there and maybe die out? You know, well, that's what we had to determine. So we went on further to say, well, these neurons we find actually do produce the opiate peptides, precisely those peptides. They're going to make the animals overeat a fat diet and become fat. So you can see here the yellow is the double labeling we see here. All these neurons here exist in the, the offspring at, at, at birth. Uh, are producing the peptides that they should not be producing at that stage in their life. Um, so these are definitely going to go on to become neurons producing these peptides. And then you can see in an animal that's after puberty or at puberty or from weaning on, these are the neurons that exist there now in that animal exposed to the high-fat diet during pregnancy. So you can see the damage that is done, and that goes on throughout life. And that's the problem we have to face now 
is how to counter this, this trend that's occurring. So this is the, uh, the, what I've just described here now, and this is the phenotype of the offspring that has higher lipids in the blood and as well as early puberty onset and obesity sets in at an earlier age. So that is the background. Um, and now I want to proceed uh, really into the second half of my talk to give you a sense and how we can translate this to understanding eating disorders. Now that's not an easy task. I mean, people, rats are not people, we know that. There are some differences, so, uh, but it's, it's the best model we have at this point to really understand what's happening to the physiology and neurochemical system. So the first thing we have here is overeating. Now, I don't, if I asked you who doesn't overeat in this room, I, you know, th there won't be many hands going up. Uh, we all overeat in some time or another. Um, and obviously we have weight gain, obesity, and metabolic syndrome. Now I'm gonna show you a picture uh, that, I don't know, it, we've been seeing it increasingly, this type of picture that I don't remember seeing uh, before 10 years ago, if not even a more recent than that. This is a picture. It, it's more common, but you see it around, and these things are just tossed around, and, and people are overeating. We all know our plates are much bigger than they used to be, the food on them. So I'm not going to describe the outcomes of all this, and I could, but right now I do want to focus on the eating behavior and the eating disorders that may come from it. So when we overeat the palatable food that we have available, there are a lot of, of, of effects that occur behaviorally. And Dr. Tia had mentioned some of these. And so it's not just, just overeating and obesity. We really must understand what occurs with food cravings. And again, I think we all have some form of food craving. So in going further from that, and some people do say that these are addictions, and that's always debatable, but they are addictive-like behaviors, um, and that this leading to uh, clear eating disorders uh, that Dr. Atiyah described. Now let me give you a few examples of our brain research to really help us maybe understand what might be occurring in these eating disorders. Um, first of all, we do know that females obviously are more vulnerable than males to eating disorders. Uh, let me give you a sense of why that is the case. Um, we know that females, as you know in the development of females, it occurs much more rapidly than in males and uh, that there's this surge that occurs at puberty uh, in just changes in the body physique as well as in the whole psychology and emotions of, of the female. But we see in the rats a rise in fat intake. It occurs over two or three days that all of a sudden the rat loves the fat. And it's just, they don't like fat up to that point, but they love fat at a certain point, and it occurs simultaneous to this rise in ovarian steroids, which then they in turn stimulate the peptide. So we have the stage set for females to have a very rapid and dramatic surge uh, in, uh, in these changes here. So what happens then, but what we then is, we gave uh, these females a fat-rich diet, and so what happened is it does stimulate these ovarian steroids, they themselves, and these ovarian steroids are stimulating the same fat-sensitive peptides that promote eating. So we have that system here going on here that's it's a, a sort of a vicious cycle where the steroids are going along with the fat diet to promote the opiate peptides to make us more, eat more fat. Now this happens in a very rapid period of time. In the rat, it's a matter of days. And we can track it behaviorally as well as neurochemically and hormonally. So this is why we feel there's one reason that females are more uh, uh, vulnerable to eating disorders. Okay, let's, now let's go beyond that. We really want to understand uh, that there are obviously more behavioral problems associated with eating behavior, not just food intake, but all the things that go along with it. Now I can't cover all this, but we're very excited about the research going on in the lab because we have, thanks to our uh, postdocs in the lab, we have extended to understand things, changes in other behaviors. Um, and we know that females are more vulnerable. With this change at puberty, they're, they're, they're more vulnerable to stress responses and greater risk for anxiety-related conditions, et cetera, things that will lead and contribute to the onset of eating disorders. So we are trying to understand these behaviors more now by looking at uh, not only the behaviors, but other brain areas that control these behaviors. 
So what happens is a high-fat diet exacerbates this whole situation, exacerbates these behaviors, produces these behaviors. Uh, by just putting an animal on a high-fat diet, you can see an increase in these behaviors. Not only that, with these behaviors here, we see even animals who we identify ahead of time that are predisposed to overeating a fat-rich diet, and there some are. Some just love fat and others don't, and that happens either genetically or from early developmental changes. Uh, with these, that just the predisposition will show the same phenotype. So that's fascinating and scary as well, that if there's this predisposition, then this, this particular rat will become more vulnerable to exhibiting these behaviors. My question eight is, now let me give you a specific example of what we find about how, how to resist fat. Um, there are not many examples of this because usually, as I say, the brain was made and the body was made to just take in food, not to resist eating food. Uh, but we do have a very clear example here, which I think is the beginning, um, that we found in, in genetic mutants. Uh, we knocked out one of these genes for galanin, and to see what happens with that, what we found is when we knock this galanin gene, this is a gene that makes the animals uh, eat more fat, okay? Um, they do not produce the galanin, as you can see here, a knockout, this is KO for knockout versus the wild type. So they can't produce this particular peptide that makes them want to go for fat. Um, and you can see that they have a great drop of fat intake. And it, it was very exciting to see, and this has been, been shown in another lab as well, that animals with this knockout of this peptide um, just so a resistance to eating fat. Um, and so that's well and good and could be an example of really what happens in particular, particular because it happens only in females and not in males. And galanin is a very highly responsive to gonadal, oh, gonadal steroids. Uh, so it really is a, is a uh, ovarian steroid peptide also responsive to fat, as I said. And we get the opposite effects when we insert extra copies of the galanin gene. We get the, the reverse of this situation. Now this sounds well and good, and, and galanin is not responsive to food restriction. It just is a peptide that's very li closely linked to fat and circulating lipids that we've found. Um, with this situation, how we have other problems that develop. And this is the, the, uh, the tug of war that occurs in anorexia as well as in binge eating and, in, and bulimia as well. Yes, there is a resistance to want to eat fat, but unfortunately, in these animals, and only in females, this other peptide pops up. And this is a peptide that is also related to fat. It has a bit, a bit of a different profile, but this pops up in females and not in males. And so what do we have here is we have a peptide that actually is stimulated by food restriction, and it itself is known to stimulate locomotor activity, arousal, and anxiety, and increase the rewarding properties of food. So we have one peptide saying, okay, I'll avoid fat, but another one saying, well, I'm gonna be more active and more anxious and do other phenotypes, other behaviors that, that make the whole situation worse. Um, so this is a complex of things by just changing one peptide and changing its expression in the brain. Question nine, let me give an example of really why, how we uh, binge eat on uh, palatable uh, fat or sugar-rich foods as, as in binge eating disorders. Opiate peptides, as I say, when you eat a fat-rich meal, it increases the expression of these peptides in the brain. So that's after the fact. What happens with when you train the animals to expect that meal, to anticipate that binge at any time of day, uh, we usually do it on the onset of the dark cycle, when you get them to anticipate it, you find that that increase in the opiate after a meal actually shifts before the meal because the training has been conditioned to that pleasure that comes out of eating the meal. It's actually elevated before that meal. So as you know, there's an anticipation of anything that's pleasurable. You're already right there prone and to overeat and, and binge on that diet. So it's an interesting phenomenon, and we are finding the triglycerides to really be predictive of that sort of binge meal. And 
the other important thing is that we find this peptide to be increased not only in the hypothalamus, but also in the cortex, in the areas that are going to control impulsivity, uh, as well as other behaviors, um, more complex behaviors. So, and there's another uh, set of studies by a, a former postdoc in the lab, Nikina Avina, um, Avina with working with Bart Hobel, has found that there, these disturbances, these sugar binges, are associated with disturbances and things like dopamine uh, that are similar to those seen with addictive drugs, and that animals who are used to binging on sugar actually do show uh, addictive-like behaviors. Now, my last question, and then I'll end here, um, is really, where are we going from here? And I, I want to just uh, um, spend uh, one minute on this to, to really underscore the importance of, of future direction now, uh, current or future direction. Um, the animal models we've learned are extremely important. We need, we've worked so hard in really understanding how, you know, when do we eat and, and what happens before, during, and after when we eat. This is important. Um, so defining your animal model that is similar to the human eating source is, is very important to do, and that takes a lot of time, perhaps the most difficult thing to do. Looking at other substance abuse, this is what we're very excited about. Um, we have a study just, we recently got a, a new grant, an NIH grant for studying of alcohol abuse, and, um, and also a new grant for studying the abuse of nicotine. So these are two drugs uh, that, you know, you wouldn't necessarily associate with food, but you must admit that drinking alcohol and having a smoke at a meal is certainly do go together. What we're very excited about is really trying to understand that the neurochemical mechanisms involved in controlling these other substances abuse um, are, are so remarkably similar to those I've described with eating behavior. So we are pursuing studies to really understand this, this sort of general mechanism that may be underlying overconsumption of all substances abuse. Different brain areas, as I say, we need to broaden. It's very important we are doing that. It's a lot of work. We're studying 10 different brain areas now to really understand their differential functions. Um, and with the behavioral problems I mentioned already, the gene screen, screening techniques, uh, these are wonderful. It really allow you to broaden really understanding of the different neurochemicals as well as other types of proteins that may be involved in, in mediating these behaviors. Diagnostic tools. Um, we have worked very hard and we do find now that triglycerides in the blood are really predictive of a lot of problems. And so we feel because they are regulating the brain, uh, that by regulating the brain, then they will lead us into a downward spiral uh, where problems will occur. So we are looking at diagnostic tools as well as to understanding, can we use those tools, uh, those predictors, to, to de develop the techniques for uh, reversing the conditions of anorexia? This is a very tough problem. Uh, which I'm sure you know, it's just even the everyday person now has to deal with, with just eating problems every day, you know, how much we're going to eat and can we lose weight or not, versus just even the other um, eating disorders that, that Dr. T has mentioned. Uh, it is going to be a very increasingly difficult problem, I'm afraid. Um, but I do feel now with, with these tools that are available here to us in the laboratory that we really have the possibility of coming up with those techniques that will allow us to reverse the situation. Thank you very much. For, for parents who are dealing with adolescent or post-adolescent daughters who are very ill with anorexia, in some cases hovering near death from it, what in this talk is close enough to pr medical practice? I mean, for example, when you talked about inserting extra copies of the Galanine gene, what is there about this new research that is close enough to clinical practice that we could actually take it away with us and talk to our physicians and say, let's go for this, let's try this? You want me to try or you, you, uh, you start with start. Gallon and Jean? Yes. <laughs> Um, you know, this is what I wanted to try to end on. I'll just make it quick. We don't have the answer. We don't have the answer. Um, my answer is prediction. 
to try to understand what is leading to this problem. Once, as you know, with, with every disorder, once you get to closer to the end of the road, it's, it's a very difficult thing to reverse at that point. I know that behavioral therapy, and I'll refer to Dr. T on this, is, is our best promise right now rather than actual treatment. Go ahead. So I, I think um, if we're really to uh, draw a conclusion from some of the science, I'd say two things. Um, one is in the area of behavior, nutritional rehabilitation. You saw how disturbed the behavior is. So even what may sound like a straightforward idea of putting behavioral change first and making sure that nutrition is replete again, however structured that treatment may need to be in order to accomplish that, um, we can take that away. So many things are known to improve. So many of that long list of physiologic and psychological changes are going to improve if we can just somehow or other get weight to return to normal. I know it's easier said than done, but there are ways. And actually, I think I had a couple of slides that may be helpful here, but there's a, for an adolescent, there's a, a recently popularized treatment that involves the family, the Mosley, the Mosley Method. It's a family-based treatment that really empowers parents to help refeed a kid and uses the structure of clinicians to help parents do that piece. Takes blame out of the picture, uh, makes sure that parents aren't paralyzed by feeling like doing something, feeding something is going to make the problem worse. Actually, it's going to make the problem better. And that's one lesson from there. Another one that I just will mention is the anxiety piece. If we really think that anxiety is so central, well, what can we learn from the anxiety disorders field? There are treatments that are very helpful in other conditions. And in the basic understanding of what's meant by translational research, what can we take from another area and possibly apply it here? So for example, at Columbia, we're interested now in exposure therapy. Uh, oh, someone was very, very good about that. <laughs> um, I don't have a slide for this part, but um, we're uh, um, in the midst of an NIH-supported treatment development grant where we're taking exposure therapy that we know helps someone who's frightened of a spider become less frightened by exposing themselves in a graded fashion to the thing they fear most, allowing them to go through that curve of feeling more anxiety and then less. If that's going to be a part of the story with anorexia, can we use those principles to help individuals with anorexia nervosa? So we're not really ready for you to go to your local pediatrician and say, I want some of that. But there are um, research programs that are starting to take a look at this in a very clinical, treatment-focused way. Thank you. Sure. I enjoyed both your talks very much. Thank you. Um, could you comment on uh, the so-called exercise anorexia? Is that an entity? And if so, is there any research being done for that? I think we can probably both say something about the hyperactivity that's seen in um, anorexia nervosa. And it's actually a, um, a, a sort of puzzling piece, right? We've got someone who's so nutritionally depleted and yet um, commonly we'll see more activity right, than usual, not less. You would think that if somebody had fewer calories um, to use that they would somehow be programmed to take it easy, but that's not the case here. Um, so I, I don't uh, use as commonly the, the terms that are out there, exercise bulimia, exercise anorexia, but there's no question we're seeing very active uh, individuals affected with these disorders, either in terms of um, just informal general movement, knee bopping and uh, moving and, you know, isotonic movements and all, all of it, um, uh, or formal exercise patterns where people will go to the gym for hours and hours at a stretch. Um, there actually are animal models that um, uh, look remarkably similar to these high activity, low intake um, individuals. And we think that there are a number of, of features that may drive the activity. Maybe there are appetite suppressant 
um, effects in being quite that active. And yes, it sort of fits in also with the mindset and the desire to lose additional weight. It's very difficult to change and very important to change because it's uh, very hard to keep up, calorie-wise, keep up with someone um, who is spending hours and hours and hours losing any calories that they may have uh, taken in. Um, there, are, there is work in that area. I can say a little bit more, but maybe I'll, I'll first turn it over to Sarah because I think some of these animals do the yeah, same thing. Yeah, there is the animal of, of activity-based anorexia, and it does, uh, the animals will just run themselves to death. Uh, and the changes that occur there is, is not a lot of research, it's not gotten good support in the field that I've known over the past 30 years. And yes, there are some changes, a few studies that have shown changes generally in dopamine, which is most, most often uh, studied, and it shows disturbances in dopamine. So it's just the question is, is that really a causal factor, a consequence, and it's hard to know really with any of these disorders that, wh what role that plays. References to you know, a variety of addictive substances. I mean, fat and sugar. You talked about nicotine. Um, were there any studies done associated with caffeine? Yes, caffeine is not uh, again not been studied and generally just studied in relation to dopamine. And caffeine does stimulate the release of dopamine, as all these other palatable substances. And I hope that. Uh, we'll move in that direction to extend to caffeine, but we've not studied it. Again, it's in relation to dopamine, and that's all we really know at this point, that it's a palatable substance, people like it, and it does release dopamine. Sometimes um, among individuals affected by eating disorders, caffeinated drinks will be used, especially the non-caloric caffeinated drinks will be used uh, to make somebody feel full, to replace a meal. Um, we wind up having sort of a secondary caffeine addiction in some of the folks who present to us. Um, I don't know that it's central or core, and no, we haven't studied it either, um, but very, very large quantities of caffeinated beverages will be reported by some of these patients. Mm -hmm. I'm curious about if you could distinguish between some studies I've read about and even seen on television in reference to low caloric um, intake and the improvement in lifespan and um, the physical condition of mice as a result of the low caloric intake, and how does this, with mice that you're dealing with in your experiments, uh, distinguish from that? Um, yes, we've all read that, and that's been, I don't know, it's been about 20 years, I guess, we've sort of known that. Of course, none of us can follow it. I don't know how many people can follow 15% reduction in body weight, but um, I, I think the main point there is that the nutrients that come from our diet are stressful to neuronal development and neuronal pr uh, production and expression. Um, just glucose, having gluco too much glucose around is not so good. Having too much lipids around is not so good for the brain. And I think anything that's good for the, for the heart is good for the brain. And we need to take that message home as well, that if people are always worried about their blood pressures and about their heart function, what have you, Everything that's bad for the heart will be bad for the brain. So too much glucose, too much lipids, um, and even too much amino acids at this point, too much of anything will be bad for, for the brain. And so I think that, as well as other tissues. So by limiting that, I think that's really, there's too much stress. Limiting that, you'll have less stress on the, on the systems. But of course, what's complicated is too little may be a problem as well. Well, indeed, so that's it's true. It's very hard as we, you know, get involved in talking about absolutely an obesity epidemic and a need to pay a great attention to keeping uh, nutrient intake into more normal um, range. We may unmask some individuals who've got a propensity to enter one of these self-perpetuating cycles of illness. Um, if they are restricting too significantly. So it becomes a, a tough message point and um, a tough educational uh, piece and um, health management piece to um, uh, help people stay healthy of weight and intake. Good evening. Could you talk a little about medications prescribed for the disorders referenced tonight? And are you treating the disorder or are you treating the surrounding anxiety, OCD, all the other things that accompany a disease like the ones you're talking about? Um, so we know a lot more, um, or at least there's um, uh, much more evidence for a utility of medications when treating uh, 
bulimia nervosa and even binge eating disorder than there is for anorexia nervosa. Um, and the treatments, I, I, I think that um, many of us uh, working in the field are pretty um, specific about wanting to see whether these medications help the core symptoms of these conditions. Uh, so uh, we take a look secondarily at whether mood and some of the associated features improve as well. But um, when we use an antidepressant medication, and I'm using that term generally, when we use a, um, an SSRI or a tricyclic uh, in order to help bulimia nervosa, we're looking for changes in the urge to binge and changes in the urge to purge and changes in behavior that way. And secondarily, we'll take a look at mood. And Antidepressant medications or anti-anxiety medications are also very successful anti-bulimic medications. Um, and the majority of folks um, who try one of these medicines will have dramatic improvement in those symptoms. Uh, fluoxetine is the only medicine with FDA uh, approval for use in bulimia nervosa. Um, anorexia nervosa is more of a puzzle and that probably has to do with the low weight state and all of the biological changes that are present in the context of that low weight state. So even in the presence of great depression and depressive symptoms and anxiety symptoms and obsessionality, medicines that should work for those symptoms don't do the job in anorexia nervosa. And um, that remains quite a challenge. We're now interested in whether some of the atypical antipsychotic medicines uh, might be helpful, both in terms of helping with anxiety um, helping with the near delusional, the sort of uh, very distorted beliefs that are present in anorexia nervosa, and yes, whether it may help with weight gain, uh, the very symptom that so many people try to avoid with the atypical antipsychotic medicines, well, maybe there's some benefit for this population. We actually have a multi-site uh, study supported by the NIMH looking at olanzapine in anorexia nervosa now. Mm -hmm. Question for Dr. Atia, uh, as a clinician here more. How do you motivate your patients uh, for change, especially the anorexia nervosa patients? So the question is a very important one uh, because as opposed to patients with depression or patients with anxiety who want nothing more than for their symptoms of illness to go away, um, with anorexia nervosa we've got the problem that the core symptom uh, comes with a real ambivalence about the treatment goal, right? So if someone didn't feel reluctant to gain weight, they wouldn't have this illness, and yet the treatment requires that um, weight change. So a question about motivation becomes extremely important, and we work hard to help motivate a patient, and that may mean um, talking about some of the peripheral signs and symptoms. Um, I. Uh, showed you that slide of Lanugo, but I also find myself when I'm talking to especially some of the younger patients um, with anorexia nervosa, I lead with, has your hair fallen out yet? Have you developed peach fuzz all over your arms and legs and face? Um, uh, if the answer is no, I say, okay, not yet. Um, you look for what pieces of this condition may connect with the patient, may motivate them to try to do something about it. Sometimes there are um, circumstantial uh, factors that really motivate someone. They don't want to gain weight, but they don't want to have to leave school, or they don't want their parents to be more in their face than absolutely necessary, or whatever it may be, um, and you try to find those, those features. Um, and it's, it's a tough part, probably the toughest part of getting the treatments to be accepted. Two questions. The first one is, since there's such a strong correlation between dopamine and the disease, um, I'm wondering if a child's on Ritalin, or specifically a girl is on Ritalin, if there's any correlation between the risk of eventually getting it. Um, I have one more question. So uh, it's an interesting part of the question. There are a lot of issues around Ritalin and stimulant use, um, very specifically cocaine use. Right? quite specifically, and eating disorders, because all of these medicines, separate from what they may or may not do with dopamine, they suppress appetite. And so they have been abused commonly um, in people who are vulnerable to or who are in the midst of 
um, struggles with anorexia nervosa and it makes the situation quite complicated. Whether there's any part of the cycle of reward that gets additionally mucked with because um, a dopamine releasing agent is uh, part of what someone's using, I, I don't know any um, particular data regarding that, but there's no question that we're um, very careful, very cautious about uh, folks with eating disorders who ask for uh, stimulant medications because it makes it hard to feed. It makes it hard to do the work. I might add that with dopamine, that dopamine for those who are over-consuming something, dopamine can either be high or low. So it's a very volatile situation, meaning if you have low dopamine, that means you want to eat more to raise your dopamine up to a certain level so that it's rewarding. Or if you have too much, if you have a lot, that makes it more rewarding. So dopamine is a complex situation in terms of trying to predict a certain illness. This is more of a practical question because I have a nine-year-old daughter um, and she's just on the verge of asking about weight and I'm just wondering if there's anything practical that I could do at this point to prevent it, if there's any preventative measures. Well, my advice is to let her be herself and let her just develop her own ways because she's going to end up doing it one way or another. And so let her ask questions and, and be very straightforward about it, very simple and try not to express your anxiety. Just you know, let her be and, and she'll, as I say, she'll learn to either overeat, undereat, or just eat normally in whatever way she's meant to be. If you're relaxed about it, she'll be more relaxed about it. I think that there's a lot to be said for healthy um, talk about normal eating and normal bodies and range of bodies and the fact that that's what's normal. Um, and balanced eating, and eating from all food groups. And right, there are lots of messages out there that say too much of something is not good for you, but too little isn't either, right? We need fat to um, create brain cells, um, to you know, create all cells for that matter. And um, I think education around that and what we use our building blocks for, not a bad idea for a nine-year-old. Are there school programs in your school that you can refer to? Because they are important as well. Uh, well, not yet. I, if you want to talk to them, because I know people have actually started their own programs at the school so that kids in general get a, an overview of really what's, what the problems are. And you might talk with people at the school itself. I have a question for Dr. Leibovitz. Is this on? Yeah. How can we have any optimism that your work in the laboratory is going to have any significant impact on a terrible social problem that we have in the United States when it's based on ethnic, geographical, religious mores that are deeply embedded? I mean, is there any real hope to solve the obesity problem? I think the, uh, the real pro issue here is education. I think we've had some impact in terms of smoking. Uh, if we can have some impact in terms of food and how we can just understand really what it does to our bodies and the brain as well, I don't think people really know that. I know if they talk about obesity, they say, well, what does the brain have to do with that? They don't necessarily understand that. So I think the education to show slides as I showed now of really what the impact of eating a high fat diet can have, if that can get out there more to the community, they'll try to say, hey, you know, that's not so good. And I think parents are really becoming more aware as well as to whether it will lead to a specific drug treatment. I'm hoping we can get through this, this, this scary period without drugs because I think drugs are, are really a problem and they create more problems themselves. So, and whether it's government control as well, we now have, um, you know, government control of how much uh, of the vending machines in schools like that. I think having some sense of that uh, is really important too. So, what my research will do, well, I think that we're heading to try to understand really what's in the blood and what it may be controlling the brain, because it's hard to control some, one thing in the brain. But in the blood, we might be act actually able to, like, uh, C-reactive protein for obesity. We understand that inflammation rises. So if we have uh, a study that shows C-reactive protein, that, that youngsters are starting to have more of that C-reactive protein at age 10, and actually my daughter has done a study with this uh, on obesity, 
that it is predictive of that individual having a higher risk for developing obesity as, as they grow up. So if we can understand predictors of this, we can also perhaps counsel uh, people on that score to try to prevent the development of obesity. See, we have a question back in the back. Give them a chance. <clears throat> Hi, can you talk a little about the relationship between bulimia and borderline personality disorder? Oh boy, okay. Um, so uh, borderline personality disorder is one of the personality disorders thought to be uh, sitting in a different uh, group of conditions um, from uh, depression and anxiety and eating disorders and some of what we uh, consider some of the major mental illnesses in psychiatry, um, but that doesn't mean it's not uh, severe and important and, um, and often associated with lots of the rest uh, of the conditions under AXIS-1, under the major mental illnesses. Borderline personality disorder is a condition in which um, interpersonal functioning is quite impaired. Uh, relationships are impaired and the ability to tolerate distress and uh, the ability to uh, um, think in the ways we all need to think to be healthy, shades of gray, right? That's somewhat impaired and things are either black or white or all good or all bad. Um, there's some thought that uh, there's a higher um, a rate of these kinds of problems among some people with eating disorder symptoms and that those who um, binge and purge uh, may have some of that impulsivity uh, and some of those traits that are commonly seen in a personality disorder. Um, so what, what do we make of that? Um, the two are present together in bulimia some of the time, uh, but personality disorder may not be present in individuals with eating disorders as well. So I think a comprehensive evaluation for anybody who's struggling with one of these problems is important and um, a real you know, understanding of the range of things that somebody uh, struggles with is going to be important in coming up with the best treatment plan for that individual. I see that I'm about 15 minutes beyond uh, our schedule, so this is a, this is a, it's good to hear uh, this level of, of interest. I think there will be an opportunity at our reception to, to, to uh, continue this discussion, but let me thank Evelyn and Sarah for a, a wonderful presentation and wonderful discussion. Thank you.